Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when you are watching or listening to us. And thank you for being part of this beautiful community of material business. My name is Monica Hernandez, and I'm your host today. And I, I, I have a super special guest, Nicole. Thank you for being here. It is super great to have, you know, another very successful woman in STEM and uh, that can talk to us about all these world of codings and how can that tie into sustainability. So we keep on with the sustainability capsule. Yeah. And this is going to be tied into that. So thank you, Nicole. No worries. Perfect. So she is the codings manager for vision integrity engineering. 18 years of experience in the corrosion science and coding technology industry related primarily to oil and gas production systems and pipeline operations. Nicole started her career working in a coding and failure analysis laboratory in Edmonton. That's in Alberta, that's in Canada for everyone that is outside of Canada. <laughs> and eventually she became the manager for that lab and both labs actually. In addition to her time in the lab, she also worked out in the field as a coding inspector and coding consultant. From there, in 2013, she moved to Calgary and was um, and has worked for engineering firms, as an owners, and independent contractor. Since moving to Calgary, Nicole has worked in pipeline and facility integrity, coding inspection, failure analysis, but mostly as a coding subject matter, subject matter expert. In addition to her work in the coding industry, Nicole is an active member of several professional organizations and regularly speaks at industry events. She's also a published author with articles and papers on coding technology to her name. Nicole is passionate about educating others about the importance of coding and is always eager to share knowledge and experience with others. And today is an attestation of that specific <laughs> uh, thing. Thank you, Nicole. No worries. No, I'm so glad to be here and, and thank you for having me. Absolutely. So let's start. My first question perhaps is, Codings is not an industry that is, you know, very appealing. A lot of people don't know that that is even a possibility. So can you tell me what was the reason that you were involved and you are involved into it? So, yeah, it's the codings industry is kind of an enigma in that it's a huge industry. At the same time, it's a small industry. It's a close knit group of people. Um, and a lot of people aren't aren't aware of it. So I I got into the coatings industry. Honestly, it was a pure accident. Um, I took materials engineering technology at NEAT, which I selected by going through the book of engineering courses that were offered and whatever page it landed on, and it landed on materials engineering. I had never heard of metallurgy or statics or lots of those topics and I thought well I don't really know what I want to do so I'll just let fate decide and then when I got out of when I got out of Nate when I graduated I kind of still didn't know what kind of job I wanted to do if I wanted to work in an office work in the field and so I kind of said to myself you know what I'm going to apply for all the jobs and the first offer that I get I'm just going to take it regardless of what it is. And basically, I'm like the luckiest person on the planet. The first job that was offered to me was offered by a wonderful lady named Linda Gray, who uh, was running a codings laboratory in Edmonton. And she, you know, it was, I was so lucky that that I got into it. I'd never heard of codings when I was in school. Um, I was scared when I first when I first started. I was like, what did I get myself into? But once I realized kind of how many different directions that you can go in um, and that codings are everywhere. 
it's bridges, it's municipalities, it's military, it's oil and gas, it's everywhere. I thought, how are there not thousands of us, you know, you know, getting getting into this industry? So I'd love to say that, you know, I had this massive passion for coatings from a young age. I didn't. I it was an accident that I that I got into it, but I was I was basically really lucky. And what you're saying is so important. Several of the the participants in the podcast in the past have said that they have some kind of either a teacher or a parent or a family member or someone in their path that kind of was their mentor or their their guide if you want and yeah. uh, transpass that you know knowledge and passion into them and that seems to be also your case and it it really confirms what I, I have been saying is we need those role models we need to show and this is the whole purpose of material business is to show that there is uh you know, wonderful people doing wonderful things and raise awareness so younger generations of women and men can yeah. see that it is possible and then you can do it. And then, like you said, coding is so tiny, people may not need, may not hear about it, but it's at the same time so important. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes uh, we don't really you know see that until we get in touch with someone like yourself so thank you for for that and that <laughs> prompts me into into the next thing is so how is this coding and you know selection uh of the proper coding how will that tie into sustainability uh perhaps in the oil and gas which is um an area that most of our audience are attached to right so you know, when I when I first came to Calgary, I I was with a group of integrity engineers, and every every one of them said, "Oh, Nicole, I'm so glad you're here, um, because I hate coatings. I hate I hate paint and coatings." And I I was like, "Why do you guys hate the the coatings? You know?" And it's because they don't have that background, so they're put in charge of making these decisions of, you know, how do we get to um the service life that we want how do we sustain this equipment and they've got all of the welding and what i call like the metals the metal stuff because that's their background but then they also have to choose the non-metallic materials to ensure that sustainability but they don't feel confident in that area and so you know i've on on the one hand, like I've walked into tanks and vessels that have coatings that are 30 to 40 years old. So this is perfect. This is like we are sustaining our equipment. Coatings are our first line of defense against corrosion. And so to me, that's so important, right? That's That's giving us a longer service life. And in some cases, we see those successes. But on the flip side of that, I've seen equipment that was coded, not even put into service, and the coding failed. And so I think that's part of, you know, it's this huge spectrum of performance. And we can have that 30 years. We can, you know, get that sustainability, have these really good products that give us long service life but we have to do things correctly. And so sometimes I feel that some engineers think, you know, coatings aren't gonna affect sustainability, right? Like they fall apart or, you know, we're not sure that it was applied properly or, you know, I've seen them fall apart when I go out to the facility and, and stuff's falling apart. And so in their mind, the coating isn't a factor. Um, but I think that it is, it's just that in a lot of cases, we haven't done things properly and people don't understand why. They don't understand what went wrong. And so 
they're not sure what steps they need to take in order to ensure that they get the 30 year service life instead of the zero year service life. So we definitely impact sustainability, but I think as an industry, we need to do better. If that makes sense, you know? That's total sense. And uh, yes, it's exactly what we have been saying is we have the tools in hand to spend less money, hurt less people, and don't damage the environment if we take better decisions. That is what everything really narrows down to. And you are confirming that because, you know, like service, the impact of any service of product towards the environment that is determined at the design phase. So if we really, it's like 70% of its productivity and then how it will impact environment, people and everything is at the beginning. So if we take better decisions at the beginning and it's what you're confirming, it's then we'll get what we want and then we'll get that service life that we want. We will get less headaches and then less firefighting activity throughout the life cycle. And I think like a really good one of my probably my favorite examples of that is um, when I first moved to Calgary, I was working for an owner company and I had a report hit my desk for uh, near surface casing corrosion. And it was given to me that, you know, we have corrosion on these surface casings. We know that a coating cannot handle like it's really aggressive conditions it's cyclic seg d so it's it's hot and cold it's wet and dry it's expansion contraction all of these things but nicole just give it a skim just to say that we you know put the check mark that we know a coating isn't going to be able to to handle those conditions and i took a look and it is a very aggressive service condition but i thought you know, this looks a lot like corrosion under insulation to me, hot and cold, wet and dry, expansion, contraction, aggressive chemistries. Like, why can't we use a corrosion under insulation coating for these near surface casings? And so I went back and I said, you know, we can use a coating for this if, you know, we can try. And we trialed 60 casings that year. and um did an inspection like a year down the road everything looked really great and we added more and more and more and then other companies have since adopted they also coat with cui coatings their casings and when we looked at the numbers with the production accountants of what we were paying to do the coating work versus um the money we were saving, um, it costs between a thousand and five thousand dollars to coat one casing. So a thousand bucks if we don't have to excavate too much. And from the first sixty wells, we had determined that the savings was twenty seven million dollars, which didn't even include the potential for lost production. But if we didn't coat those wells, we have to do inspection because we know corrosion is happening. We have to do weld repairs or we have to stop the steam if we feel it's too much of a risk, right? Like there's a lot of corrosion going on. We're not going to cycle the steam. Um, and so, I mean, what's what's better than that, right? Where you pay a couple thousand dollars and you're getting back millions like i i think that um and i did a paper on that in tw- in 2020 of after i think it was like five or eight years that the program had been started was it successful how is it doing and it is successful but no one at the time was aware that it was even a possibility right they're like no it you know it's too aggressive like we it's not going to happen but they didn't have someone knowledgeable in the coatings industry take a look at it. 
So, you know, there's lots of wonderful things that we can do, but we need the right people in the right place at the right time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, kudos to you because just thinking outside of the box made this, you know, great discovery happening. And then, like I said, saving thousands of dollars, um, yeah. millions actually. And that is what we keep saying, right? This if we invest at the right time, it's an investment. It is not wasting your money. And then, yeah, it might be a different CAPEX versus OPEX exercise. Yeah. But then throughout the life cycle, it definitely pays out. So, it, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Excellent. So how do you think this has evolved uh, in the past, let's say, decade? Um, the coding industry and then specifically because we are now more aware about sustainability and how can that be tied into what, what are your thoughts about what has been improved? So yeah in the last 10 to 15 years I see I see it kind of twofold with the codings industry and how it's evolved. The first is um health and safety related really right we've taken our coding formulations and we've tried to reduce those harmful components that you know 20 years ago we used to be able to use but but now we can't so we're we're lowering the vocs the volatile organic compounds because those are dangerous for for humans um, a lot of water-based products are being used, which are both good for health and safety, but also for the environment. Um, and the introduction of viscoelastic materials, which I call kind of a combination between glue, paste, and gum. I don't know how else to describe it, but um, uh, completely safe for the environment, completely non-harmful to people. I actually have some in my closet here as a as an example. And so, you know, coding formulators are constantly coming up with ways on the one side to make it healthier, safer, and better for the environment. On the flip side, we seem to have more and more aggressive conditions the operating temperatures seem to be increasing over time. Um, problems with upsets in conditions where, you know, we might have rapid depressurization. Um, and so they've had to kind of do both at the same time of making sure that our coatings can withstand the conditions at the same time, making them safer for everyone in the environment. And I think a really good example of this, um, so for corrosion under insulation, we really 10, 15, 20 years ago, only were using TSA, which is thermal sprayed aluminum, very popular on offshore. Um, and that was really, that was kind of the only option, right? If you had really bad CUI conditions, that's the coating you have to go for. But within the last 10 or 15 years, there's multiple products now that are available, that are easy to work with. And with COVID and the coding shortages where, you know, maybe we'd like to purchase TSA or some other product, you can't always get your hands on the products that you want anymore. Um, and so the coding manufacturers really went to town and said, you know, we have products that can compete with thermal sprayed aluminum. Maybe they're a little bit cheaper. Maybe they're easier to get in Canada. And so these formulators are just constantly rethinking and redesigning things. And uh, I mean, I can't believe how much has changed in the last 10 years. I kind of it's a little bit frightening to think, you know, I'm not going to know anything 10 years from now because everything will change. And it's one of the big things with the coatings industry in that it's constantly changing. Like when I think of metallurgy, I kind of think it doesn't really change that much. I'm not a metallurgist, so I could I could be wrong. But, you know, carbon steel is carbon steel. We know the properties. We can tweak it so much. We can alloy so much. But we have a really 
long period of time of understanding how metallurgy works and how we can adjust things. But paints and coatings, it's changing all the time. We're doing new things every, it's almost like the tech industry, right? Like you just, you really got to stay on on top of it. So it's it's interesting. And I, I learn new stuff every day. It sounds super interesting. And it is, um, it is very interesting to know that the fabricators and those people that are creating uh, the coatings and the paints, they are adapting to conditions, which, I mean, it, it happens, right? We sometimes we design for a will that is supposed to be sweet. And then over time, we all know that it can become very, very sour, very aggressive. And then none of the materials or coatings or anything that we applied at the design would uh, withstand those conditions anymore. Yeah. And that is just the nature of, of that business. So uh, it's how at the design stage we can kind of see uh, what is going to be happening uh, if at all possible, so we can cover our bases. Yeah. So you've told us what is, you know, the challenge, like not the the changes and the positive things that we are adapting, we are getting. Now tell us about the ugly stuff, what hasn't changed. Like <laughs> I always, yeah, and the, one of the, the, the guy that spoke about geothermal, I said, okay, well, that's beautiful. Now tell me the ugly stuff. And he's like, oh, nobody has ever asked me that. <laughs> so <laughs> tell me about what is the ugly stuff. What is, you know, what hasn't yeah. changed? What can we do to be better? Because there is flaws in anything. So what are we not doing that we should? Yeah, I, you know, if I go from kind of the beginning of the process to the end, you know, I... When it comes to the design portion, I see so many drawings that specify the coding that are copy and pasted. They're just copy and pasted, copy and pasted. Um, and I mean, some of these even I've seen like from 1985, like codings you can't even buy anymore in North America. But, you know, like an EPC company is put in charge of building a facility say or something and they're just pulling the coding over from before and typically it's because they don't have subject matter experts in house and they just don't know and so I, I get a lot of complaints from applicators from coding inspectors where they're like you know they know that that's the wrong product but they're not the engineer who made the drawing like they can't make that change um, and sometimes we don't find out until, unfortunately, a problem has already occurred. And then I look back, like, why was this coding selected even for this piece of equipment? Um, so that kind of stuff, I I really like to to see a change in that, you know, the coding selection right from the design stage, whether it's on the drawings is done properly, but also in the specifications. So. I call like selecting the coding for your approved products list for your coding specification. It really should be a loop that you need to close. And I see a lot of companies that have part of the loop, but they don't have the whole loop. So the first thing we need to do is look at what are the operating parameters of this equipment? Are there pressure cycles? Are there temperature cycles? Um, what are the chemistries? Is there is there solids involved? Is there sand involved? Um, so we need to review those those operating conditions. Typically, then we would go to qualification testing. And so we'd say, OK, the general chemistry of coating that we want for this pressure vessel is a, a 100 percent solids epoxy. Well, in the qualification testing, you can look at a number of products and see which one's coming out on top. But laboratory conditions typically do not fully reflect field conditions. 
In addition, applying a coating to a nice, flat, straight test panel is incredibly easy. And applying it to nozzles and flange faces and brackets and sharp edges is not. And this is the biggest one that typically gets missed from the loop. So we know the coating chemistry we want. We did a lab test, which weeds out the bad actors, the really bad actors. We don't even want to look at these ones over here. Now you send the coatings to an applicator and determine ease of application to small internal pipe diameters or brackets or nozzles or whatever. And you get the feedback back from that applicator that, hey, you know, this stuff kicks over or cures within 20 minutes. It's messing up my spray equipment. You know, I can't work with it. So then you whittle down your selection from there again. From there, in a perfect world, which we don't always live in, but you could put either test panels into your vessel or you could do a trial vessel. So a vessel you have surveillance or monitoring on. If you're not really confident, is this coating going to work? Is the corrosion rate through the roof? You know, but I did it up in Cold Lake where I trialed new coatings on vessels that I could. We're going to open those vessels up the next year and see, see how they're doing. So it's this whole loop of laboratory, ease of application, and field conditions. Besides that loop, the only other option that we have to select the proper coating for the equipment is if you already have equipment that's coated with, uh, with a certain coating that you know the performance of. So not only is this equipment operating at the same conditions as the thing I want to coat over here, because a lot of times they're not the same. Some people think like, oh, it's a slug catcher, it's a pressure vessel, it's a separator. But the coating reacts differently to some of those parameters. So are the parameters the same? And have you actually looked inside that equipment to make sure that the coating is working? And then you don't have to do all of the other stuff. But probably in the last, I've written, I don't know how many coding specifications in the last 10 years, too many, lots. And most of the direction I get is, well, Nicole, just, just choose whatever coding you like. Like, no, like I, you know, like this is, this is not the right way, but sometimes asset owners, they don't want to pay the money for the lab testing is usually like a couple thousand dollars like three to ten thousand dollars to run a qualification program they don't want to put test panels in their vessels because then they have to pay an inspector to pull them out and assess them and you know it or the other thing i hear which i don't like either is we'll just let the applicator decide what he wants to apply like what like we know better than that, right? Like applicators, I would never try to be an applicator. I'd be a horrible applicator. Their job is to know how to apply the coatings, how to do abrasive blasting. That's their role. They don't choose the coatings for the different pieces of equipment. And then the other one we get is, we'll just reach out to the coating manufacturer and they'll tell us what to use for our equipment. Now, sometimes this works out and that's fine. Great. Like they made a good recommend recommendation and it worked out. But sometimes the coding manufacturers don't fully understand how all tens of thousands of different pieces of oil and gas equipment operate and the chemistries involved. Um, or they they know about their own products, but they don't necessarily know about competing products that are maybe better or new formulations that are out and so it you know it it can work out but sometimes it doesn't and so we need to stop copy and pasting from old specifications from old drawings that's that's not working 
we need to really look at selecting our codings properly, whether that's looking back into field case histories of similar equipment or going through that loop. And I, th I think that would make a massive, massive difference to the entire industry. Thank you, Nico. Just listening to what you're saying, it is sometimes it is unbelievable that with so much data that we have, because we do inspection all the time. And uh, I, we just had Chankra coming into the podcast and he said, we need to stop chasing corrosion and uh, chasing corrosion is going and inspect, inspect, inspect. But yeah, what, what are you doing with that data? And you said it perfectly. We can do better. Like, can we just take all that data and say, okay, yeah, if you're having this condition specifically, avoid using that one because it's not working. It really didn't work for these conditions. And uh, it, it is sadly, it is not only you know, in the coding industry, it is in the corrosion industry, the acid integrity industry, with all ties in together. Yeah. And you, everything that you said, we kind of summarize it. We work with something that is called the golden, the golden wheel. So if you have your processes and procedures and the tools and your people, and then they all work in harmony, then it works, and then your wheel advances. Yeah. If you have one of those that is a little bit short, then just start having, you know, little, little problems on going ahead. And uh, yeah, it is to a some extent is like I ask myself, how can we be thousands of years? Well, maybe not thousands, hundreds of years. <laughs> maybe we had this discussion in our previous lifetime. But hundreds of years of experience and uh, and still we are saying the same kind of messages we need to do things better we need to take better decisions and i think it's a responsibility yeah, uh, yeah. and then i take it like that it is our responsibility to make it work in a better way uh, with all the expertise with all the data that we already have so you have summarized it in a in a really wonderful way, like from the beginning to the end. How can we make this whole life cycle work? And uh, it is it is worth it. And and the thing I say to my clients too is, if you're not going to do those things, if you're not going to you know get a good applicator, have a third party inspection, have a proper coding specification. If you're if you're going to do those halfway or you're going to do two out of three, whatever, then don't coat the equipment like mm -hmm. like have surveillance, have inspection intervals, have corrosion coupons. There are lots of other ways to ensure that you're maintaining that equipment that maybe you replace it every five years or so. You know what I mean? Like, but don't take your money, throw it in a barrel and light it on fire. Like mm -hmm. don't, you know, if if you're not going to do the coding application part right and the inspection, the proper specification, then you're just wasting your money. Like you might as well don't code it, which is fine. That's perfectly yeah. fine for owners to do if they want. Leave it bare. Make sure your monitoring and surveillance are where they need to be for the corrosion rate. Save your money and don't code it. And those are decisions that have to be taken again at the beginning, right? So if I'm not coding because I am, I think you know Alberta is very dry and we don't we don't have CUI, whatever it is, then have some other measure um, and then make the continue the continuity plan for those decisions happen right because if the person that takes the decision is not there anymore in five or ten years then we don't have the, that continuity of how was that decision or why was that decision taken so again full back to the decision makers <laughs> <laughs> perfect so how can we as a coding industry collaborate with 
other industries. We spoke about EPCs, we spoke about owner operators, consultancy firms, and corrosion integrity. So how can you see that collaboration or what is the best way of have that worked out? Yeah, and that's, I mean, the big one for me is the EPC and the asset owners. That's that's the biggest one where there's just a disconnect and um, and a lack of awareness, right? Like it's it's what they've been doing for a long time or they've seen those coatings for 20 years. So I'm just going to use the same thing I always did. I think the EPCs and the asset owners really more awareness. And I mean, I do presentations and lunch and learns as much as I can, I, I I love doing them. And I do find that they make a difference. I mean, um, I, I guess I call it like staying in your lane. So we know who the proper people are to ask the questions of. Do I expect every mechanical engineer and materials engineer I know to just completely educate themselves on codings and and get up to speed? No, absolutely not. They they don't need to, but they need to know who's the right people to talk to. So when we have applicators who are becoming coding specifiers, they're not staying in their lane. When we have mechanical engineers with no background in codings creating approved products lists, without reaching out to maybe the specialists or the laboratories or the code, you know. So, you know, I would say the biggest thing is for the people who are making these decisions, when you have a, a question about how this coding is applied, you know, what are the health risks? What are the environmental risks? Reach out to those applicators. I, I do it all the time. I'm not an applicator. I have questions every week for applicators. Um, when you have a question about selection, reach out to a specialist. When you have a question of, you know, formulations, new products, the coding manufacturers love to do lunch and learns as well of the new products that they're designing and the performance testing that they have that can give you some of that confidence. And so I think, I think the biggest thing is our industry needs to do better with creating that awareness that we're here and and we know things in different areas and and we're here to help you don't have to copy and paste things you know like we we're we're here to help and and we can make it easier and we can make it better and that is the whole thing about getting a community and then awareness of who can we reach to when we need and we keep hearing it again and again with people that come to the podcast is you don't have to and I remember one of my teachers in engineering he said to me you don't have to know at all you only have to know who to contact to in yes. in a case of you are in at 2 a.m in the morning in the plant something happens who will you call yeah. so you'll need to have that support system that comes in and back you up um and that is exactly what needs to happen instead of trying to do things that are out of our alleys and then having consequences at the end. Because that might not be right now, but we'll see it over time. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly. So, and, and we are almost at the end of our time. It All the time it goes by so fast. <laughs> <laughs> But what will you say to those companies that want to, you know, tie into the sustainability, the coding, uh, and those practices? How can they do better? Yeah, yeah. No, that's a that's a great question. And uh, I mean, if if I got to pick only one thing, and I'd like to pick more than one thing, but if I only got to pick one thing that you know the owner says my coatings aren't doing well you know they're falling apart one thing that i can do to improve that i would say it's having third-party coating inspection 
because that's your insurance policy that the coating was at least applied properly. So we have some oversight, even if it's just a couple of hold points that, you know, the blast is good, the cleanliness is good, we've removed contaminants, because the, the preparation and application portion are a very big reason if those go those go wrong more often than other different factors. And so if we have that insurance, that's going to make the biggest difference. If I got to pick two things, I would choose, it's the coding specifications. We have to have, the, if, if we don't have the right product and it's applied perfectly and beautifully, what does it matter? And I'm I'm writing a paper right now. It's not done yet, but it, I'm writing a paper. I've reviewed more than 130 premature coding failures from the year 2000 to present day only. And it used to be that the rule of thumb was roughly about eight out of 10 times. The reason why a coding fails is because the application went wrong. The data that I've looked at so far is showing that that's only about 45% of the time something went wrong with the preparation or the application. The remaining 55% is now split between the owner and the specifier, which sometimes is the same and sometimes is not. And so that tells me, like, in in the 1990s, we implemented uh, the ISO 9001, so quality control, so that our applicators had to be ISO certified, so their quality went up. And then in addition, SSPC, which is now AMP, they implemented an applicator training program. So we have these two things that were supposed to help applicators have better quality. And from what I'm seeing in the data so far, that has been somewhat successful. That has improved the quality. But now we've lost out on specifying the right product. And a lot of the examples that I've looked at, it's where the specifier just wasn't aware. They didn't know all of the parameters. They didn't know all of the conditions and the wrong coding got put into service. And so we still need to keep on top of the application. That's still important. 45% is a big number. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need that third party inspector there to be on top of things. But now we have this 55% between owner and specifier, which tells me equal amount of effort needs to be put into selection and specifications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So we are getting better, but then losing track of something else. And then, so it is, we need to step up and make yeah. it, make it uh, work in a better way. Yeah, it is. There's still lots to do. Yes, yes, but we're gonna do it. I'm so, I love this industry so much. It's so interesting and and it's we have great people in this industry. I don't want to make it sound like we're not we're not doing good things. We are doing good things, absolutely. But continuous improvement, right? Like are mm -hmm. we are we better today than we were in the 1990s? I think we are. I think we are. But we can't stop that process and say, oh, we, we have it all figured out. We just do the same thing over and over and over again. No, we can still continue to do better. And, you know, these are kind of the different factors that we've talked about today where I think we're going to get the most bang for our buck if we can just improve a couple of these things. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Nicole, it's been wonderful listening to you and learning a little bit about, about you know, how this all ties in into, you know, better decisions, better selections and extending life of our assets so we don't spend money where we don't need to. Yeah. 
and then most important we don't harm people or the environment and and then we you know keep on a world for our children <laughs> where <Yes>. they can live. <laughs> Perfect. Any last you know message for the audience, people that are listening to us and all that? I would I would just say, you know, be open to paints and coatings. Be open. Uh, reach out, reach out to me, reach out to your coding manufacturers, your applicators, you know, I know sometimes a lot of engineers don't feel confidence in that world. And so they maybe, you know, don't want to seem like they don't know everything, but, you know, I don't know about tons of things. And I just, I guess I would want, I would want everybody to just be a little bit more open that, you know, coatings are a big part of corrosion control. They can do wonderful things. And if you feel unsure about coatings and and you want to lunch and learn or, or you want some training, like reach out. There's there's lots of wonder, wonderful people in this industry and and we're all happy to to help and answer questions. Perfect. Nicole, thank you so much. It was really really great having you here and um to the audience thank you so much for you know keeping building this community and then listening subscribing and all those beautiful things and uh, i'll come back in the next week or so to present another chapter of this sustainability portion thank you nicole thanks so much monica really appreciate it